perform an analytic number theory. Uh, that means I study problems which originate from number theory using analysis, uh, complex and real analysis and functional analysis. So the problem that I'm going to talk about, it's called the subconvexity problem. And it's really about uh, studying a certain class of functions called L functions. And uh, the problem is about getting a bound for this L function to control the size of this L function. All right, so L functions, uh, You'll find L functions all over mathematics. Uh, like uh, L functions are there in representation theory, in uh, geometry, uh, of course in number theory. Uh, L functions are expected to, it's kind of a bridge between all the branches in mathematics. So it is expected that they will be used at the end to link all the branches of mathematics together, okay? And in fact, there is a program, uh, it's called the Langlands program which says that all the L functions that uh, you come up in, uh, you, you encounter in mathematics, even if it is coming out from say number theory, uh, it should be, it should have a, you know, a pair coming out from representation theory as well. Okay. So it's called uh, any, any uh, there are certain uh, special types of representations called automorphic representations of linear groups, they are general linear groups. And uh, the L functions to them are called automorphic L functions. And it is uh, conjectured that any L function that you see are automorphic, okay? And, uh, and the most important problem about uh, L function is to understand the analytic properties of this. Okay, so let me start with some very basic examples of L function. We all know about uh, the Riemann Jeta function. This is something that is related to uh, the Riemann hypothesis, which is one of the most important problem in mathematics. So it's defined by uh, uh, Jeta S, uh, it's sum over one by N to the power S, where you add, it's a series, N is running from one to infinity. And if you take uh, S to be a real number larger than one uh, from high school mathematics, you can show that it's a converging series. And uh, Riemann was first to study this function as a function of a complex variable. So he took S to be a complex number and he showed that if uh, the real part of the complex number is greater than one, then it's absolutely converging. And you can actually uh, extend this function to all of the complex plane, except there is a problem at s equals to one, where it has a pole, okay? It's going to, be, it's going to blow up at s equals to one, but at any other point, it will have uh, meaning. You, you can assign a number uh, to jeta s for any s other than one. Okay, and it has uh, this Euler product. So it can be also written as a product over all primes of one minus one by p to the power s to the power, oh, this should be minus one, not minus s, okay? So again, here and here, this is all minus one, sorry. So uh, that, so to this equation over here is uh, just the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which says that every integer can be written uniquely as a product of prime powers. Okay, the next uh, class of L function was started by Dirichlet, uh, who, uh, if you start with a character of the group Z modulo QZ, where Q is a positive integer, then he uh, defined L as chi to be uh, sum over chi n by n to the power S. So it's uh, almost like the Riemann Jeta function, except having one in the numerator, you have chi n, where chi n takes value on the unit circle. And uh, Riemann actually showed that this class of L functions have the same properties, okay? So they have, they make sense for all number, complex number except possibly S equals to one. And there is something called the functional equation which relates the value of, even for a Riemann Jeta function, there is a functional equation which relates the value of Jeta at S with its value at one minus S. Okay? And then there are other uh, sources of L function, as I said, uh, so one is uh, from this. Uh, so if you look at uh, this polynomial equation, y squared equals to x cubed plus ax plus b, where you take a and b to be two integers, then this is called an elliptic curve, okay? And understanding the integer or rational solution of this uh, elliptic curve is still an open problem. We do, do not really know uh, whether there are infinitely many. So if you give me two numbers, a and b, and if you ask me whether this has infinitely many rational solution or not, uh, rational means fractions, integer by integer, uh, then it's really a problem. There is no uh, real way. 
I'll come back uh, to this later. There is a conjecture which uh, says when it has an uh, infinitely many rational solution. Anyway, if you have this uh, equation, then for any prime, you can reduce this. You can look at uh, study this equation modulo that prime. And suppose uh, we define this number AP to be P plus 1 minus the number of solutions that you get when you reduce this modulo p. Then uh, you can attach an L function using this recipe. You take the product of all primes, 1 minus AP by P to the per half plus S plus 1. But again, we have minus 1 over here, not minuses. That's a typo. Anyway, so APs are actually of size root p. So this root p over here is like uh, normalizing this one. So this is another Euler product, which is like what Riemann had. But here you'll see that it's a, it's a polynomial in 1 by p to the power 2, it was s of degree 2. Here it was of degree 1. Okay, so this uh, L function is a little more complicated than, than the Riemann Jeta function. Okay, and then there are uh, other very uh, uh, difficult examples of uh, L function. One is uh, due to Artin. Uh, so I'll just, uh, uh, so if you have a Galois representation, uh, so rho is a Galois representation, f is a number field over q, uh, and v is a vector space, then uh, with, with that Galois representation, you can attach an L function. So this is called the Artin L function. So this is an example of, of what is called a Motivac L function. So as I said that there are uh, so different sources of L function, and this is a different uh, source. Okay, and finally, uh, this is the example of automorphic L function. So you have an automorphic representation which uh, the automorphic representations look like this. So they are tensor product of local representation by V, where V uh, runs over all primes or places if you are looking at number field. And then the L functions are defined as uh, product over all uh, primes. It's like the Weller product that we have over here or uh, in the earlier slide uh, of the local L functions. Anyway, so uh, if you haven't uh, seen this before, then it will not make much sense. But as I said there, um, uh, my, uh, my uh, aim was to show that there are different types of L functions in the world. Okay, the uh, basic analytic properties of these L functions are often uh, quite easy to prove, especially if they are coming from automorphic forms, then they're quite easy to prove. If they are coming from motivic, uh, uh, motivic source, then they're very difficult. If you start with an elliptic curve and get an L function, uh, the Hasse L function that I define, then showing that it has analytic continuation beyond real part of uh, S greater than 1, it was a very difficult problem. And the only way to show that was to sh show that actually that L function is coming from an automorphic form. Okay. So, uh, so these are the basic uh, properties that uh, the L functions usually satisfy. So they will have a Weller product. So it will be a product over all prime numbers. And then it will, have, it will be absolutely converging in some half plane. And it will extend to whole of C with possibly finitely many folds. And then it will satisfy some functional equation which will relate the value at S with 1 minus S. The value at 1 minus S will correspond to a different function, not really that. It's also a contragradient L function. And one also expects that uh, the coefficients of this L function, uh, the coefficients means, uh, you know, this AP by root P and this chi P and one over here, they will be bounded. So that's the, the famous Ramanujan conjecture. Okay, so uh, those are the basic uh, properties that we expect the all L functions to have. And then uh, why are these L functions important in number theory? So the first thing is, uh, uh, you, so Dirichlet actually was the first person to introduce L function in number theory. And his aim was to show that there are infinitely many primes in arithmetic progression. So if you uh, look at, uh, say, something, some basic arithmetic progression, like, uh, say, uh, you start with 1 and then 5, and then add 4 to that 9, and then 4 to that 13, and et cetera. So it's an arithmetic progression. And then the problem is to show that there are infinitely many primes prime numbers in that progression, okay? And if you start with any progression, provided that uh, the GCD is one, it should have infinitely many primes, right? So that uh, Dirichlet, uh, for that he introduced that L function L S chi, and he showed that uh, to show that there are infinitely many primes in that progression, you have to show that this special number, the value of this L function at one is not zero, okay? So that's how he related the problem in number theory 
to some uh, a property of the L function. Okay. And later Riemann uh, showed that the, the prime number theorem, the prime number theorem was uh, about finding out how many primes you have up to a given magnitude. So if, if it start with a real number x, which is very large, you want to count how many primes you have up to x. And uh, Gauss actually conjectured a precise formula for this function. He said it's about x by log x. And that came to be known as the prime number theorem. Though Gauss didn't prove it, uh, Riemann actually showed that to show the prime number theorem, uh, to prove the prime number theorem, one has to show that the, the Riemann jeta function is not vanishing at the line with real part one. Okay, and this, this, came, uh, this was proved later by other than the Lavalier-Posse. That was like 100 years after Gauss conjectured the prime number theorem. Okay, and the famous Riemann hypothesis says that the, the zeros of the Riemann jeta function, the non-trivial zeros, that means the zeros inside this uh, region, which is called the critical strip, all line on the central line. And uh, if you prove this Riemann hypothesis, then you'll get a very strong prime number theorem. So then you can show that the number of primes less than x is almost exactly equal to this integral, dt by log t, the integral from 2 to x, plus an error term, which is like square root of the size of the term. So this is a very strong uh, prime number theorem. If you show this, then this error term will be a little o of x. So a little o of x by log x, because this is like x by log x, and the error term will be slightly smaller than x by log x. And then uh, we have other conjectures, like the, as I said, mentioned before, the elliptic curves, and you can attach L functions to elliptic curves. And then uh, the problem about elliptic curve is to determine whether there are infinitely many rational solutions or not. And there is a famous conjecture due to Barch and Swinnett and Dyer, which says that if you start with an elliptic curve, it has infinitely many rational solutions, if and only if the L function attached to that vanishes at the point half. Okay, and this still remains an open problem. So there are, you know, you have a number theoretic problems, and they are related to properties of these L functions. And that's why we're interested in studying these L functions. Okay, and now I uh, slowly come towards the, the subconvexity problem. So a consequence of the Riemann hypothesis uh, is that the size of these L functions cannot uh, be too big. So they will go to infinity, but they cannot grow very fast, okay? So the Riemann hypothesis will imply what is called the Lindelof hypothesis, which says that uh, the L value or the, the L function grows like a power of the conductor, Q pi to the power epsilon. Where Q pi is, uh, I'm not defining it here, it's called the conductor of the automorphic representation, which is basically a measure of the complexity of the representation. So more complex the representation is, the conductor will be higher for that. Okay. This is called the Lindelof hypothesis, and this is one of the most important problems in analytic number theory. And what we can do towards it, as you know that there in the last uh, 100 years, uh, more than 150 years or so, we haven't made any progress towards Riemann hypothesis, uh, truly speaking. Okay, uh, now Riemann hypothesis says that uh, there are no zeros in a strip, and what we have got so far is that we have shown that there are no zeros in a region where the region uh, is very, very thin. It, it becomes thinner and thinner as you go up the edge. Okay, so it's like a zero progress. So if you compute the area of that region, that's like a zero percent. Okay. So there is no progress towards the Riemann hypothesis, and. Uh, but fortunately, there is some progress towards this Lindau hypothesis, okay? From uh, the complex analysis, you can at least show that this is bounded by the analytic conductor to the power one quarter. And uh, unfortunately, this, uh, if you're interested in uh, number theoretic problems or problems in dynamical systems or in geometry, then this one quarter, this convexity bound, as it's called, is of no use, okay? And in most cases, what you need is to get an exponent which is slightly smaller than one quarter. So you want to, you are aiming for an exponent of the type one quarter minus delta. Delta can be very small, like one by a billion or something, doesn't really matter. But as long as you have something smaller than one quarter over here, you can get interesting results out of it, okay? And this is called the subconvexity problem. Okay, why is it this important? Okay, so uh, to me, the subconvexity problem is important because 
It's a kind of central problem in analytic number theory. So the other central problems in analytic number theory, apart from Riemann hypothesis, is the Dirichlet divisor problem or the Gauss circle problem. The, Dirich, the Gauss circle problem says that if you take a circle uh, around the origin of say area X, then how many lattice points are there inside the circle? And, uh, and we haven't made uh, much progress, though we're slowly improving the, uh, you know, getting a more and more accurate answer to that question, but uh, the conjecture is uh, far beyond what we have today. And uh, if you have, if you make some progress in subconvexity problem, because uh, these things are linked, not directly, but at least the tools that you use to prove subconvexity can be used to prove, improve this, uh, you know, get towards a uh, device a problem or Gauss circle problem. Okay, and the other reason why we look at it, why we like it, is that it's very challenging. Okay, it's not uh, easy to get subconvex bound. And uh, in the last uh, 100 years, it has exactly a uh, history of 100 years. Uh, the first subconvexity bound was proved in uh, 1919 by Herman Weil. So in the last 100 years, we have proved, uh, we have only tackled uh, the degree one and degree two cases. So when the Weller product has pol polynomials of degree one and degree two. And from degree three onwards, it's more or less quite open. So I have uh, proved some instances of subconvexity in, for degree three, and nothing is really known beyond degree three. And uh, so, and finally, the subconvex bounds can be used to uh, prove other things in other branches of mathematics. For example, if you are interested in, uh, so one basic example is, uh, it's called a Linux problem. So you start with a sphere, you start with a sphere, and uh, say of radius n, and you take, a, and take n to infinity, and take the rational points on those uh, sphere, and as n goes, you get more and more points, you project them down on the unit uh, sphere, and so you're getting more and more points on the unit sphere, and you to know how these points are distributed. Okay, and Linick conjectured that they're equidistributed, and you can show that using subconvexity. Okay, and other things are like the equidistribution problem for special points on moduli spaces, or something uh, to do with physics, quantum chaos. Uh, and uh, finally, let me just uh, you know, precisely state the two things that I proved, that if pi is an automorphic form for SL3z, that means the degree three, then this is a subconvex bound in the T aspect, and if chi is a Dirichlet character modulo Q, then you have this subconvex bound in the twist aspect. Okay. Thank you.